In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Today is the 14th of April, which is the second Sunday after Easter. From the Roman Martyrology. The Feast of St. Justin, Philosopher and Martyr who was yesterday mentioned. At Rome on the Appian Way, the birthday of the holy martyrs Tiburtius, Valerian, and Maximus, who suffered in the time of Emperor Alexander and the prefect Amacius. The first two were converted to Christ by the exhortations of Blessed Cecilia and baptized by Pope St. Urban. They were beaten with clubs and then beheaded for the sake of the true faith. Maximus, who had been the prefect's chamberlain, was touched by their constancy and confirmed by the vision of an angel, believed in Christ, and was scourged with leaded whips until he died. And in other places, many other holy martyrs, confessors, and virgins. There are gracias. Today, being Sunday, we honor and make sacrifice and prayers in honor of our holy patrons, and tomorrow, in honor of our guardian angel. 
with joyful greetings again to you for uh, um, joining for, on our live stream today. It's wonderful to be able to unite ourselves together with you in prayer um, with us amongst your Papa Strong Saint. First spiritual notice will be taken from the Glories of Mary by our Holy Father, St. Alphonsus. Turn thine eyes towards us. The prophet Isaiah foretold that, together with the great work of the redemption of the human race, a throne of divine mercy was to be, was to be prepared for us poor creatures. In a throne shall be prepared in mercy. What is this throne? St. Bonaventure answers, Mary is this throne, at which all just and sinners find the consolations of mercy. He then adds, For as we have a most merciful Lord, so also we have a most merciful Lady. Our, la our Lord is plenteous in mercy to all who call upon him. Our Lady is plenteous in mercy to all who call upon her. As our Lord is full of mercy, so also is our Lady. And as the Son knows not how to refuse mercy, to those who call upon him, neither does the mother. Wherefore, the abbot Gurek thus addresses the mother, In the name of Jesus Christ, my mother, in thee will I establish the seat of my government. Through thee will I pronounce judgments, hear prayers, and grant the graces asked of me. Thou hast given me my human nature, and I will give thee my divine nature, that is, omnipotence, by which thou mayest be able to help to save all whomsoever thou pleasest. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The next spiritual notice will be taken from the sermons of our Holy Father, St. Alphonsus, for the second Sunday after Easter on Scandal. The wolf catcheth and scattereth the sheep. The wolves that catch and scatter the sheep of Jesus Christ are the authors of Scandal, who, not content with their own destruction, labor to destroy others. But the Lord says, Woe to that man by whom scandal cometh. Woe to him who gives scandal and causes others to lose the grace of God. Origen says that, quote, A person who impels another to sin sins more grievously than the other. End quote. If, brethren, there be any among, among you who has given scandal, I will endeavor this day to convince him of the evil he has done that he may bewail it, and guard against it for the future. I will show, in the first point, the great displeasure which the sin of scandal gives to God, and in the second, the great punishment which God threatens to inflict on the authors of scandal. First point, on the great displeasure which the sin of scandal gives to God. It is, in the first place, necessary to explain what is meant by scandal. Behold how St. Thomas defines it, quote, Scandal is a word or, thought or act which gives occasion to the spiritual ruin of one's neighbor, end quote. Scandal then is a word or act by which you are to your neighbor the cause or occasion of losing his soul. It may be direct or indirect. It is direct when you directly tempt and induce another to commit sin. It is indirect when although you foresee that sinful words or actions will be the cause of sin to another, you do not abstain from them. But scandal, whether it be direct or indirect, if it be in a matter of great moment, is always a mortal sin. Let us now see the great displeasure which the destruction of a neighbor's soul gives to God. 
To understand it, we must consider how dear every soul is to God. He has created the souls of all men to his own image. Let us make man to our image in likeness. Genesis. Other creatures God has made by a fiat, by an act of his will. But the soul of man he has created by his own breath. And the Lord breathed in his face the breath of life. The soul of your neighbor God has loved for eternity. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Jeremiah. He has moreover created every soul to be a queen in paradise and to be a partner in his glory, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Second book of St. Peter. In heaven, he will make the souls of the saints partakers of his own joy. Enter thou into the joy of, of thy Lord, St. Matthew. To them he shall give himself as a reward. I am thy reward exceeding great. Genesis. But nothing can show the value which God sets on the souls of men more clearly than that, than what the incarnate word has done for their redemption from sin and hell. If, says St. Eucarius, you do not believe your Creator, ask your Redeemer how precious you are. Speaking of the care which we ought to have for of our brethren, St. Ambrose says, The great value of the salvation of a brother is known from the death of Christ. We judge the value of everything by the price paid for it by an intelligent purchaser. Now Jesus Christ has, according to the Apostle, purchased the souls of men with his own blood. You are bought with a great price. Corinthians we can then say that the soul is of, a, of as much value as the blood of a god. Such indeed is the language of St. Hilary. Tom copiosa munere redemptio artitur, utomo deum valere, valere vidiatur. Which basically is uh, so abundant of redemption is made that man it would seem to be, it would seem to be God since he was bought at the price of God's blood. Hence the Savior tells us that whatsoever good or evil we do to the least of these, his brethren, we do it to himself. So long as you did it to one of these, my least brethren, you did it to me. Some very striking thoughts here from our Holy Father, St. Alphonsus. Firstly, what scandal is and it is by word or act, giving occasion to the spiritual ruin of one's neighbor. And this is, St. Paul just pointed out, that can either be done directly by directly committing a sin with someone else, inducing that person to sin with you or with them. Or it could be done indirectly by uh, doing certain things and by that example causing the other person to follow in, in suit. And this is very displeasing to God is from the two reasons that we just saw from uh, St. Alphonsus. Firstly, as God being our creator, and we were made in the image and likeness of God, to have that soul that was made in his image and likeness marred and, and killed, as it, as it were, the soul killed by mortal sin uh, is a grievous, grievous offense, and it's a great offense against charity towards our neighbor. And even more, when we look at the fact that if we can't see this so clearly from the fact of our, our God being our creator, which is very clear, but if we can't see it from that point of view, from the fact that God is our redeemer and that he has paid for the soul of our neighbor with the very price of his own blood. God came down from heaven and purchased that soul to whom uh, when a person takes scandal, he loses that soul. And so when, if we have been guilty of the sin of scandal towards our neighbor, that is, it's basically just wasting what, it, I mean, it's not, God's uh, efforts are not ever wasted, but it's it's wasting the price of blood, so to speak, for that soul, that soul that could have been saved, but by the 
sin or scandal of one's neighbor, that soul could be eternally lost. And so it's a great evil scandal, and we must do our utmost to, well, firstly, for our own soul's sake, not sin, but then also not to lead others to sin and take that, take souls from our God who has purchased them with his own blood. So for the remainder of these, uh, of this, uh, these notices, we'll have, um, have two more uh, things to bring up in the notices, and then we will have the Holy Rosary, followed by the Breastplate of St. Patrick and the Prayer Against Satan and the Apostate Angels, followed by uh, a blessing, and then there'll be devotions to Our Lady and the Holy Face. So I started reading a bit on, because I think it is so important, from the great means of salvation and perfection. And we're just going to continue on prayer as a means necessary to salvation. So the author of the Opus Imperfectum says that God has given to some animals swiftness, to others claws, to others wings for the preservation of their life. But he has so formed man that God himself is his only strength, so that man is completely unable to provide for his own safety, since God has willed that whatever he has or can have should come entirely from the assistance of his grace. But this grace is not given in God's ordinary providence, except to those who pray for it. According to the celebrated saying of Janon Dius, quote, we believe that no one approaches to be saved except at the invitation of God, that no one who is invited works out his salvation except by the help of God, that no one merits this help unless he prays, end quote. And it's so true. We, do, we don't merit our, our own salvation. All Grace is a free gift from God, but he's given us this gift to be able to pray and ask for more graces. And so then salvation in that sense is put into our, um, uh, by our own free choice and, and because we're given the grace from God to respond to him, uh, to pray for more graces and to seek his help when we, he gives us that grace. So we must take up this, um, this grace he gives us, this sufficient grace to pray so that we can Pray for those graces that we need to conquer temptation, to persevere in our faith. From these two premises, on the one hand, that we can do nothing without the assistance of grace, and on the other, that this assistance is only given ordinarily by God to the man that prays. Who does not see that the consequence follows, that prayer is absolutely necessary to us for salvation? And although the first graces that come to us without any cooperation on our part, such as the call to faith or to penance, are, as St. Augustine says, granted by God even to those who do not pray. Yet the saint considers it certain that the other graces, and especially the grace of perseverance, are not granted us, granted except in answer to prayer. God gives us some things as the beginning of faith, even when we do not pray. Other things, such as perseverance, is only provided for those who pray. And this is only, in a sense, uh, just. Obviously, we can't even begin to do anything without God's grace. So that first grace to respond to him has to be given to him. But once God has given us the grace to be able to act and to be able to respond to him, then we have to cooperate with with that, and we have to cooperate with the means he's given to us. And the means he's given to us is to pray for continuance of graces and to pray to save our souls and pray during temptation not to fall. And, and, and whenever any difficulty comes upon us to respond by that prayer petition asking God's help because our all our help, all our strength is in God for especially in everything, but particularly for achieving that supernatural end, which is in heaven, which is completely beyond our human powers. So for the last notice, I'd like to reflect a little bit on 
this Sunday being Good Shepherd Sunday. So I'll read the Holy Gospel for today's Mass. At that time, Jesus said to the Pharisees, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd giveth his life for a sheep. But the hireling, and he that is not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf scat catcheth, and scattereth the sheep. And the hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling. And he hath no care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me. As the Father knoweth me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep. And other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So in today's gospel, our Lord names himself with the title of the Good Shepherd. And with this title, he compares a flock of sheep with mankind. A flock of sheep is vulnerable to many dangers and needs continual support requiring a good, loving, and protecting shepherd for the sheep's well-being. Mankind, likewise, is vulnerable to many dangers and requires the good shepherd that loves the sheep even at the price of laying down his life for his sheep. So in this notice, we will look at we will consider our Lord's parable of the Good Shepherd in three points. That there is a fittingness of comparison, which our Lord uses in this parable, between sheep and mankind. Secondly, having seen the similarities in this comparison of the flock with mankind, our Lord's title, the Good Shepherd, reveals itself in the reality of him giving himself his own life for our salvation, his redeemed flock. And thirdly, we should follow the voice of our Good Shepherd and not those of the hireling or a false shepherd. So firstly, why does our Lord use the comparison, comparison between a flock of sheep and mankind? Well, there are several reasons that can be given, but I will just offer a few. So firstly, this, this is not a new comparison that our Lord brings up. It goes far back into the Old Testament and what's what our Lord is building upon. Such as in Ezekiel, although this was a reprimand. So for our Lord said, Lord God said, For my shepherds did not seek after my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flocks. The priests at that time were not looking after their faithful, but rather only themselves. But we may ask, why the creature of a lamb, a sheep? Because sheep particularly need a protector, a guide, a healer, a carer, a leader. In one word, they need a shepherd. They need a good one also. Sheep are prey to wolves or birds of prey or, any other, or many other predators. As they don't really have a particular defense mechanism or system. Sheep also require guidance to better pastures. Sheep require care for their wounds. And often, if, especially if you've had anything to deal with uh, sheep or, or young lambs, they typically, if they get sick, they, they will not get well without the most attentive care. Most of the time, if, if they get sick, they most of the time will perish unless the shepherd goes to them and gives them particular care. Also on this point, shepherds often knew their sheep as it were individually. They knew their particular weaknesses, strengths, and even had uh, could call them out by name. Also, for general well-being, sheep should be shorn and cared for. Sheep often, when also they're in large fields or pastures, can stray from the flock, and they require the vigilant eye of a shepherd to bring them back into the safety of the flock, because without being in that flock and under his eye, they will certainly be vulnerable to 
the predators. Now, if we compare sheep with mankind, we see some similarities. Men, particularly as regards their salvation, are prey to the devils who seek their damnation. Men are drawn by the evil of, from their own inordinate concupiscence of their own passions, being pride, lust, gluttony, covetousness. And thirdly, the world draws us to sin. We men need a protector from these evils. Men starting on the path of salvation require guidance in the spiritual life. This is why the church instructs priests to teach catechism, hear confessions, preach, in order that the faithful flock might be guided to good and beneficial pastures. We men need a guide. Men on the path of life fall into sin and wound their souls, and sometimes in a deadly manner. Men also accumulate many faults from day to day. And just as sheep need the hand of a healer for their deadly wounds and sicknesses, and a shearer for their excessive wool, so do men need the hand of a physician and a confessional to absolve them of the deadly wounds of sin and to release them from the excess faults and smaller sins that they daily acquire. We need a healer and a carer, and one who knows all our strengths and weaknesses. Further, sheep can stray from the flock, and then they will be vulnerable to predators. Men, by their foolish pride and obstinacy of will, can follow lives outside the commandments of God, making them vulnerable to eternal damnation. We men need a leader. In one word, we need a good shepherd, a pastor bonus, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this brings me to the second point, which our Lord says that he is the good shepherd of our souls. Our, but our Lord takes the role of a shepherd further than what ordinary shepherds would do for their flocks. Ordinary shepherds would protect, guard, heal, guide, care, lead, and shepherd and know their individual sheep, but they would not go so far as to lay down their lives for their sheep, although they may come to some risk in their lives by defending them off from predators. I don't think the majority would actually die for their sheep. But our Lord Jesus Christ, the pastor bonus, the good shepherd said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. Our Lord is a shepherd, which the priests mentioned in Ezekiel were not. Our Lord cares for his sheep so much as to lay down his life for his very sheep. And this is what we celebrate today in this second Sunday of Easter. The sheep, that being us, fallen mankind, being prey to wolves, this, our flock, fallen mankind, was lost. And the Good Shepherd came down from heaven in search of this one lost sheep, mankind. The Good Shepherd picked up that lamb, and he took it up in his arms, and carrying it on his back, to, back to the, his flock, in order that the lamb might learn of his goodness. And this is a note there. I remember some of the church fathers talking about that the... With the parable of the 99 and the one, the 99 are the angels, and that one lamb that was lost is, uh, is mankind. So that's where I'm kind of picking this up from, too. And so this lamb on our Lord's back learns the nature of the Good Shepherd's voice in order that this little lamb might follow the Good Shepherd further on and obey his voice as is a, a, a word of truth. And thus, it is for us mankind. Our Lord did, did exactly this. He, he descended down to earth, and he carried the cross, bearing us upon himself while he was carrying that cross. St. Paul said of our Lord's passion, by whose stripes you were healed. 
the blood wounds and difficulties of the cross of Christ healed our wounds. And our Lord carried us upon himself close to his sacred heart, and he asks us to repent, to learn of his goodness, and to learn the nature of his voice, so that we might recognize him from other hirelings and from false shepherds, so we may recognize his truth. If we follow the voice of this good shepherd, we will infallibly go to that new and eternal pasture which is found in heaven. And this brings me to the third point, which is that we must truly love and know this good shepherd so that we can follow his voice. Our Lord said, I know mine, and mine know me. As the good shepherd recognizes, each of us individually knows our faults and weaknesses. The sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd. And I have seen this actually particularly with uh, uh, with sheep, but also I guess in more of us uh, seen it more clearly with certain orphan sheep. And the little lamb, if, especially if he's adopted by uh, someone, he becomes very alert and attuned to his shepherd, even just the least indication or sound that he recognizes of that person, uh, even just him that person is saying a word, the sheep will immediately bleat and uh, happily that his shepherd is coming to see him. And this is how we should be for uh, with our Lord. It is also known that those who are closer to the good shepherd will get the most, uh, the best treatment. And so we too should go to our Good Shepherd, particularly in the Blessed Sacrament, and draw close to him so that we may partake of the graces and the care that he wishes to give us. In our Lord, while there, he gives us graces, but in one sense he's silent. But we also can find our Lord in, in his written word, in the Gospels. We can hear the voice of the Good Shepherd in the inspired spiritual writings of the saints in and preaching of good pastors of the Catholic Church. But the sheep must recognize the voice of our Lord from those who are false pastors and false shepherds. Our Lord promises in the gospel there will be one fold and one shepherd. This fold is our Catholic Church, but we must beware of hirelings and robbers that will enter into the flock of the Catholic Church and preach words that are contrary to our doctrine. And St. Alphonsus taught, touched on this when we spoke about scandal. These false words are not the words of the Good Shepherd. We have to know his voice. And we know it by loving our unchangeable Catholic faith, as it has been since the time of the Apostles. The voice of our Catholic faith does not change and cannot change. We must recognize the voice of Christ in the midst of the chaos of modern society, which is affecting many shepherds in, in the church. And these worldly shepherds are not speaking with the voice of Christ, but with the voice of the world. We must not follow their erroneous teaching, but we must follow Christ as St. Paul said. And even at that time, he was making this point. Remember your prelates who have spoken the word of God to you. And he says, remember. So those the, the, um, so when we hear from, uh, from false teachers, from worldly teachers, anything that is contrary to the original word of Christ, go back to what uh, the authentic teaching is. He says, remember your prelates who have spoken the word of God to you whose faith follow, consider the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and the same forever. Our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and the same forever. The faith does not change, his voice does not change. Further, St. Paul warns, Be not led away with various and strange doctrines. For it is best that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited those that walk in them. And I think that's an interesting point. With grace, that is spiritual goods, 
the heart be established with grace, which are spiritual goods, and not with meats, which is kind of a figure of worldly abundance, luxury. Which I think is pro the prominent fault in today's society, the false hopes of a paradise on earth in modern society, wanting this false paradise on earth without God. So in conclusion, let us love our good shepherd who has given his life for us as sheep. Let us approach this good shepherd often in prayer in the Blessed Sacrament and approach him for the graces we need. And let us learn to recognize his voice in the solid teachings and doctrines given by the champions of the faith, the popes, the bishops, theologians, and saints. The voice of the church is not the voice of one period of time only. It is a voice going back all the way to, the, to our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles. And through the centuries, it makes one strong, pure resonance. Anything discordant to that powerful voice of 2,000 years of tradition is suspect as a false voice and not that voice of the Good Shepherd. Let us pray to our Blessed Lady now in the Holy Rosary for the graces to approach the Good Shepherd in our personal needs and struggles, as well as for the needs of the Church at large today. I am the Good Shepherd, and, not, and I know mine, and mine know me.